Korean Natural Farming, a regenerative practice, I'm Christina Trout of Lala Gardens. First, there was thistle. To understand thistle, I need to tell you about a reoccurring dream I had as a child involving a centipede. Weirdly, the scene of the crime was in a white bathroom in a white bathtub. In my attempts to kill the centipede, it would break into half and grow, and those halves would break into halves and grow until the bathroom was literally full of centipedes. Terrifying. This is how I view thistle. Thistle arrived after I'd done everything on my property I thought a good permaculturist should do. I'd already tilled, too late for preserving the existing fungal communities in the soil, but I knew enough by the end of my training that if I could keep the soil covered, that diversity would return. So I got to work building layers of cardboard, wood chips, leaves, not to mention the literal dump truck loads of composted manure. Why did I feel like I needed to do all of this? I have rock hard clay soils. The most used tool in my bucket of garden tools is an ice pick. More than a decade later, I have soils that are still prone to compaction, but there are clumps now. Aggregates with clay and organic matter riddled with worm tunnels, and I can grow a lot of things I couldn't then. So success. And then the thistle, fast in succession, after the bindweed. I'd created a haven for these unruly misfits who moved in quickly and with great determination. We're well versed in the problems of these invasive cousins. What happens when we try to chop or poison thistle? It splits into two, three, four, and each surviving piece starts to grow more vigorously than had you left it alone. Chemical solutions seem the only option for meeting the challenges of these successional plants, whose sole duty is to populate and return to the earth in mass in an attempt to heal the original damage done from disruption, including tilling. I also knew enough to recognize that with so much effort applied in creating an environment a fungi would love, they simply were not showing up. Even over a period of time, bringing spore back from my mushroom hunts and dispersing it into the microclimates I'd created specifically for them, I'd get an occasional burst of chip-loving species, a few puff balls, but what thrived in my soils were mustards and lettuces, radicchios and brassicas. What do these species have in common? They're bacterial-loving species. I had created bacterial-dominant nitrogen-rich soils and was helping succession happen in a big way because successional plants like ragweed and thistle love bacterial dominant soils. Succession happens. Rather than seeing this as a natural law to be respected and encouraged, agricultural science-backed products and practices have us attempting to halt or reverse succession with a fix-it attitude. Soils are to be amended and weeds controlled. Succession happens. From bacterial to fungal dominance. It's natural's way of self-correcting, building soils to support even more evolving complex ecosystems. Fungal dominant soils perform in amazing ways, including water retention, disruption of pathogens, absorption of toxins, pH balancing, providing plants with a network of nutrient-seeking populations whose sole function is to provide plants with everything that plant asks for. Fungal dominant soils are literally the probiotic for the soil, in direct relationship with the probiotics within our own bodies, the very ones which secure our longevity, youthfulness, and vitality. Without probiotics, we can't derive the nutrients we need. We are plants, and plants are us, without legs. Without mobility, plants have evolved within their microregions to work with the microorganisms in the soil to provide all it needs. The microorganisms, in turn, derive their nutrients from clay and rock, the dance of soil building between plant and microbe. Problem is, we've been taught as cultivators to treat the plant rather than the conditions under which it is grown. To stave off problems, we front load our soils with everything we think a plant needs over its life cycle rather than equip it with avenues to find what it needs through relationships with the indigenous life in the soil even disrupting the soils in order to give the plant a head start in its supposed battle with nature. We anticipate what needs to be fixed in an unbalanced system. I had no idea how to fix my thistle problem. I decided to do nothing, literally. I quit spraying. I encouraged the plants which decided to stay, clipped seed heads of those I didn't want, 
and set on a course of naturalizing without understanding what or could happen. I first learned about Korean natural farming, or KNF, as it became first practiced in small circles of cannabis growers in California and the Pacific Northwest, who raved about KNF, living soils, and amazing results. And down the rabbit hole I went. I didn't follow directions. I came at it with a fixed attitude, endless ideas for how to improve the system. Having experimented with fermentation and derivations, I thought I understood what I was gathering from the misinformation prevalent online. I made huge mistakes, and yet the cannabis I grew was of such an extraordinary quality that I knew I had to learn the system. I couldn't believe the qualitative difference in not only flavor, terpene expression, but in medicinal quality. It was as if the plant was expressing a part of herself that hadn't been possible before introducing even a fraction of diversity that would later prove to me the power of indigenous microorganisms true to place and time. I first learned the fundamentals of Korean natural farming from Chris Trump, whose family owns an 800-acre macadamia farm in Hawaii where his practice of natural farming literally saved their farm. Chris learned directly from Master Cho, making the trek to Korea 11 times. In 2011, Chris and his family applied KNF to a few trees, moving to a 50-acre trial of trees, where finally his family farm is now 100% KNF and thriving. Chris teaches all over the world, and there's no end to the benefit of learning this teaching hands-on. Master Cho, who began practicing natural farming in the 60s, devoted his life to teaching, even though he faced persecution from chemical company lobbyists and government officials for his teaching and practice. Master Cho, in turn, recognizes three teachers from his early visits to Japan. One taught him respect for all life. From another, he learned about enzymes and indigenous microorganisms, or IMO. His third teacher, may, who made the first Kyoho cultivars in Japan, which are grapes the size of a baby's fist, teaching Cho the nutritive cycle of plants and the importance of observing natural law. What is so revolutionary about Master Cho's life work in Korean natural farming is that it works. It works in any environment at any time using the plants found thriving in your area. It teaches one to speak the language of plants through simple observation of the plant's nutritive cycle, much like a human cycle. Dr. Cho's simple technology is a sane response to conventional agriculture, which is ecologically not sustainable economically also not viable, and environmentally ruinous. Plant science as practiced now is more concerned with unlocking the secrets of how things work in an effort to fix a broken system than on observation of how life actually works to not only self-correct but thrive. Industrial agriculture backed by plant science views natural systems through the same inherited fix-it lens and it teaches us to do the same a fix-it scenario applied to my problem clay soils required all my fix-it approaches, ultimately defeating me. I was left hacking thistle in soil with an ice pick with no perceivable end. In fact, the thistle was filling the spaces. I was spraying with Roundup, even though I was fully aware of the implications. Helpless. A crisis of imagination, with nature's imbalances too big a problem to fix. It took me a year after Chris's class to begin practice in my outdoor gardens. I made the applications and continued to apply them in my indoor smaller garden, gaining confidence in my skills of making and applying applications. I was still entertaining the fix-it mentality, subtly thinking of ways to improve the system, coming to terms with my rebellious nature. The paradigm shift occurred with my first successful harvest of indigenous microorganisms. Building a box, making the rice, Choosing a spot 500 feet in elevation above but within my microclimate that's fungal and lush. Planting the rice-filled box in place for seven days or so, returning and unwrapping the gift of that place in such a fuzzy display of diversity, filling my nose with the aroma of a primordial forest floor. Intoxicating. What natural farming requires is a willingness to practice in order to see in order to come into a greater understanding of how nature works and to trust the process. Natural farming requires us to view nature as perfect, not as a static thing, but as a perfect working system of balancing. It requires us to become citizen scientists, basing our findings on side-by-side -side trials in order to observe the outcomes. 
of our practices, learn exactly how our inputs are supporting the natural system and a plant's drive to express its genetic potential. We learn to talk to plants. Our education concerning the growth of plants must include the awareness that a plant has everything it needs to thrive. In concert with indigenous microorganisms, plants have the capacity to build soil from rock. In healthy, fungal, balanced soil, plants an expression of true health and vitality signal to us an ecosystem in a state of regenerative abundance. Regenerative is not isolating plant compounds as weapons against insects, viruses, or pathogens. Regenerative is not bugs in a jug, microbes isolated and grown out in a lab, nor microbes brought from far off places. It is not plastic mulch. It is not tilling. Regenerative systems are discovered through simple observational skills. Regenerative systems restore our capacity for wonder, for imagination, for discovery. So what is the practice of natural farming? At the heart of natural farming lies a process of cultivating indigenous microorganisms through a simple but precise method of harvesting without disruption of any ecosystem. Introducing this diversity into our disrupted soils where it comes into balance with what's there, building and restoring a robust biodiversity. At the same time that these IMO populations are being introduced, other applications are applied to our cultivated plants through foliar or soil drenches, which directly support a plant's communication with its environment. There are various applications derived from plant materials which will populate your shelves. A library of applications needed over the course of a growing season according to the nutritive cycle of the plant. Natural farming, in essence, is the application of the right material, the right amount, at the right time. It is simple but specific. These applications are applied at ratios of 1 to 1,000 or 1 to 500 or 1 to 300, so are homeopathic in nature. So while the gathering of materials requires attention throughout the season, a small amount of the applications you've gathered go a long way and are relatively free in cost. Natural farming is effective in any place, any climate, any condition, and by its simplicity of application entirely scalable and highly economical. Cultivation becomes stewardship with such restorative practices. And as one becomes proficient in gathering and applying these plant-based applications, side-by-side -side trials are incorporated as a means to observe directly how varying applications work to increase vitality and to enhance whole system functioning. If science is more inclusive of an observational approach within whole systems, intent on compiling shareable data through these simple side-by-side -side trials, then we could chart through observation in what ways nature is a perfect system and much more efficient at solving the same problems we are trying to solve through derivative-based fix-it solutions, namely food security and a thriving ecosystem. Rather than unlocking secrets, if our attention as a scientific and academic community were on understanding the relationship between things, plant to soil, animal to human, human to the ecological whole, we would naturally come into harmony as stewards equipped with wisdom born of practice. Long live the natural farmer. About thistle. One of the KNF applications requires the cultivation of the top four inches of plant material at dawn. Science supports this magician's approach. Growth tips of plants are populated with undifferentiated cells. These cells are potent with possibility. In response to a host of environmental conditions, these cells can liter literally do and become anything. All the materials required are present, including hormones and enzymes necessary for growth. It's these compounds we're drawing out with sugar, which has a drawing effect much like salt. Thistle is one of the plants I now harvest for this application. Its growth pattern is unmatched, the mineral content impressive. Two, it's medicine for parasites in humans and antipathogenic in nature. By increasing the vigor and growth of my hemp this year in part through the application of thistle, I was able to use my hemp crop to control the understory of thistle from emerging. It's still present, but I'm no longer cutting it in an attempt to kill it. It's become an indicator of soil health and a marker of the successional state of my garden. I know to mulch and inoculate, to harvest and respect through deep appreciation what nature is trying to show me.